get into our next topic, which is the role that social media plays in this. And please, I raise your hand if you have thoughts on this after this question, but who do we charge with monitoring social media and acting on those threats? We know that a lot of schools in Texas have these school threat assessment programs which have very specific protocol of here's what we do if there is a concern that is brought to us or we see something, how do we help that student? But how do we in just regular public life address something if there's, you know, there's so many different social media channels. Uh, the Uvalde shooter was using one that I had never even heard of. So how, how do we find those threats and assess them and what do we do with that information? Councilwoman? Yeah, thank you. Um, so this has actually happened to me this past week. Um, somebody came to me and said, I saw that my friend from elementary school who I also knew posted on his Facebook page that he wanted to kill his mom. He's going through a really bad time right now with a divorce um, and then losing custody of his child. And so we talked through that situation. Well, he made a threat online. He mentioned that he had guns. The next logical step is to bring law enforcement into the picture and alert them to what was said so that they can go out and do their due diligence and take care of the situation. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's going to happen. Like, these things are going to happen. But if we collectively as a society take note and we take that personal responsibility, recognize that we saw something and we need to say something about it, that will put us in a much better place. If you talk about what happened with the Uvalde shooter, um, my understanding is that he had posted online about it multiple times, but nobody came forward. And we have that responsibility in our community that when we see something, we reach out to the appropriate authorities to ensure everybody's safety. I, th I think on that note, and uh, Edwin mentioned it earlier about our judicial, our, it, it does not punish, it punish, it's punishes something you do or some action. It doesn't punish things you think. However, when somebody posts something online, that's, there's no expectation of privacy there. There's an expectation of privacy in my head or maybe in a conversation with somebody, but you put something publicly online, then I think that is a red flag, no pun intended, and there should be action that's available to see if that threat is real. Edwin, what kind of laws already exist related to this, sir? Well, um, the terroristic threat law um, was written, and it is very expansive. I believe there's six different types of terroristic threats, and anything that threatens or is designed to alarm uh, the operation of any kind of institution uh, is considered a terroristic threat and can be enforced, that law can be enforced immediately upon seeing that threat. Um, and that kind of uh, it dovetails exactly uh, to what uh, Senator Patterson said about, you know, when you put it on social media, uh, your, your intention is to alarm people. You know, that's what, that's what the social media exists for. If I'm just having a private conversation or I'm jotting things down in my diary that never get published, then yeah, I can have them, I can think that, but, but uh, and in fact, I believe that something very similar is how they caught, uh, what, the 10-year-old in Florida who had posted something online about shooting up his school. They immediately went out and arrested him. Now, we can have a debate about the mental culpability of a 10-year-old, but that showed that the system of laws that are already in place actually worked. Why don't you tell our viewers and listeners what exactly that definition of threat is? Because I think there's a lot of examples where perhaps maybe the Buffalo shooter before he posted his manifesto had been posting hateful things, but it might not have been, I'm going to go kill a bunch of black people. So at what point? Well, and that's going to be a, a matter of degree, and it probably will get down to what the district attorney's office in a particular county wants to enforce, uh, what the police want to enforce. Um, and I know that you know our, our criminal laws are based in large part as to what a reasonable person would do or how a reasonable person would react. And unfortunately, you know, we all consider ourselves reasonable, and so you know, there may be a process where the district attorney's office prosecutes several people, and a jury ultimately will decide whether or not that can be reasonably considered to be a threat or not. And so that's where we get down to a, a jury of our peers. As the councilwoman pointed out, though, with social media, I think there's a bit of a bystander effect. You know, if you see something and you it, maybe it's alarming, you think, oh well. This has a couple of comments and likes, maybe someone else will post it. So who do we charge with monitoring that stuff? I'm, I'm honestly thinking that people should partially be charged with their own safety. I mean, speaking for myself, if somebody goes on you know, social media and threatens me, uh, I'm going to handle it my own way, whether that's contacting the authority or just kind of addressing the sincerity of it, like if, if it's somebody who is credibly a threat or if it's just 
somebody looking to vent some steam. And then if I think that they're a threat to my life or my safety or my family's safety, I'm going to contact the authorities. And I think that, you know, trying to split hairs with politi with laws and policies and <clears throat> almost infringing on people's rights of uh, freedom of speech is not necessarily the answer to safety. But instead, you know, everybody's got this complex of, you know, somebody else will take care of it. You know, there, there's this, um, I, I'm paraphrasing, but basically there's a, there's a meme out there that, you know, there's a bunch of people, one guy's choking and everyone walks by him and says, you know, someone else will take care of it. And that's what we're seeing on social media is everyone sees it, but everyone's like, ah, someone else will report it. Well, take charge of your own life, take charge of your own community. And if you see something, say something. Or, or reach out to the person. I mean, if one of my friends posted something outlandish, I would call, give him a call and say, hey, man, w what's going on? Why'd you post this? Because it, it came off a little crazy, and I want to make sure you're doing all right, um, instead of just a assuming that someone else is handling it. Um, oh, you want to pass the mic to <laughs> Lisa? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I do a lot of education is what I do, and I do education in schools, and I talk to high schoolers, I talk to middle school students, I talk to a lot of them. And um, one of the things that I've educated on several times to a lot of these kids is that I hate to tell them, but they're almost the first responders. And by that, I mean is that when they are in a situation, they're in a chat room, and they are inside there, and somebody is making threatening statements, or they're um, talking about even harming themselves, then they have an, a responsibility to let an adult know about that that's going on. And I can give you a perfect example. I have a really good friend of mine whose son was in one of these chat rooms, and I share this story with these kids. And, and, um, and her son came out to her, her and her husband, they were sitting watching TV, and they said, um, Mom, you know, I, I've got this kid on our, our line, and he's, going to, he's saying he's going to commit suicide. You know, he's going to, to kill himself. And he goes, I believe him. I think it's serious. And so, um, and um, at first they kind of just brushed it off. You know how parents, oh, it's just children, we're not going to pay much attention to this. And he was, no, no, no. He was very adamant about the fact that he knew this kid was going to hurt himself. Sure enough, they ended up calling the police. The police went over, and yes, he had taken a handful of pills. They ended up having to call an ambulance, and they had to have him taken to the hospital. So I tell them and share that story with them, not to, because I want to scare anybody and I want them to be afraid, but I want them to be aware that at this point in time, unfortunately, our children, our children are almost having to be first responders to situations like this. Pivoting to Representative Howard, there's a lot of conversations at the federal level about regulating social media, and that's a huge topic that we can get into. But do you think some of this responsibility needs to fall on the shoulders of these companies that do have, you know, thousands of employees, hundreds of thousands of employees who are working to look for things that might be of concern? You know, I, I had a very brief conversation just recently. Uh, we have an IT caucus at the Capitol, and we happened to have a meeting recently with some tech companies. And Texas Capitol, to clarify. Sorry, the for Texas everyone. Capitol, yeah. yes. Uh, and we didn't, it was a brief conversation, but there was concern raised that by the tech companies about how they would really be able to make this happen if they were responsible for it liability if, so, if something happened and they hadn't caught it. Um, so I, I think that it's worth looking at. We obviously have to figure out how do we monitor social media, but I don't know what the answer is at this point. I think it's going to require that we talk with the tech community itself to see what, what makes sense and how we can make this happen. And go ahead, Jerry. You know, there's, there's a, another issue, and this is something we hadn't talked about, I have a way that we could uh, dramatically reduce mass shootings. It's very simple. I know it would be effective, but it's unconstitutional, and it's not what you think. If we banned all news reports of a mass shooter, no name, no report, and we would have fewer copycats. Because notice what has happened since Uvalde. Copycat, copycat, copycat. But we can't do that because we have a constitutional guarantee of freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Well, and what would you tell those, I mean, I, I was in Uvalde talking with those family members, talking with the community, and I had so many people come and say thank you for sharing their stories, for letting, and I'm, you know, maybe y'all feel the same about Doug of, you know, making sure that he's remembered. So I find that is, and, and I fe felt the balance of, you know, 
being there to do my job and make sure that people know about what happened, and know the facts, and know who these children were and these teachers were. But also, I, I understand. Yeah. It, in other words, freedom has cost. People lose because of the freedoms we enjoy, and sometimes it's losing your life. But if you were living in a country, you could ban all reporting of mass shootings. We could have fewer mass shootings. We can't do that. I'm not suggesting we should. Anyone have a opinion, response? From a personal experience about, you know, uh, legacies and, um, and, and having uh, meaning to life and all of that you're saying that those parents were expressing to you because, you know, every day, you know, my son's been, you know, it was 12 years ago and, and not a day goes by that, I, you know, I, I feel that and I know that. And every single time I hear this, it takes me right back to the moment of that loss as well. And I'm, I'm feeling that pain right there with them. And it, it is, it is, people don't understand, but it is extremely difficult to live knowing this and knowing these people and because you want to do something to stop it so bad. And there's not, like you, it just happens over and over You're again. reminded every time. Every time, yeah.